Welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm your host, CEO Dan Mary Ash, and thank you for joining us today. On July 18, 1994, the deadliest terrorist attack in Argentina's history occurred when a bomb, 600 pounds of explosives concealed in a van, was detonated, killing 85 people and injuring hundreds more at AMIA, the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires. It's been 26 years since the attack on the AMIA building, and though no one has ever been brought to justice, the signs clearly point to Hezbollah, backed by Iran. Joining me today from Argentina for this edition of our Experts Analysis Series to discuss the lasting impact of the attack and more is our special advisor on Latin American affairs, Adriana Camisar. A native of Argentina, Adriana is an expert on Latin American issues. Also with us today from Montevideo, Uruguay, is our Director of Latin American Affairs, Eduardo Cohn. Eduardo has been with B'nai B'rith since 1984 and has spent nearly 40 years advocating for the Jewish people in Latin America and the State of Israel. He's a highly regarded analyst of Latin American Affairs. Now in our conversation today, we'll be speaking about the AMIA terrorist bombing in Buenos Aires and how Argentina's relationship with Iran evolved over time. We'll also talk about Iran's malign activity in Venezuela, how Latin America is dealing with new waves of anti-Semitism, and more. Adriana, Eduardo, great to have you with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Adriana, as a native of Argentina, uh, the AMI attack certainly hit home for you. Uh, give us an overview of the 1994 bombing and uh, some of the background uh, leading up to the bombing. And why do you think that the Jews and the Israeli embassy in Argentina were targeted at that time? Well, Dan, um, as you know, on May, um, on March, uh, sorry, on July 18, 1994, a car bomb exploded in front of the building of the AMIA uh, Community Center in Buenos Aires killing 85 people and injuring hundreds. It was the deadliest ter terrorist attack in Argentina's history. And nobody has been brought to justice to this date. Unfortunately, it wasn't the first Iranian sponsored attack on Argentine soil because two years prior to that, in 1992, a suicide bomber attacked the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires killing 29 people and also injuring hundreds. And uh, again, uh, nobody has been brought to justice for that attack either. Uh, there are, there are uh, you know, the reasons why these attacks took place are complex. I don't think there's one reason. Um, at the time, you know, we had um, our president was Menem, who had decided to have uh, closer relationships with, with the US, with Israel. Nisman, Alberto Nisman, who was the prosecutor of, of the AMIA case, thought that um, one of the reasons was that Menem canceled a nuclear agreement with Iran. Um, but there were other reasons. Um, I remember he cited also that they knew that Argentina, well, Argentina has the largest Jewish community in, in South America. Um, they knew that the borders of Argentina were very porous, you know, uh, very easy to, to cross. Uh, they knew, and this is sad for me to say, but they knew that there was a lot of corruption in Argentina. So uh, it was a fertile, fertile ground to do something like this. And, and the, the other thing, uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the, in the security and, and armed forces in Argentina. So maybe that made it easier too. Where were you the, the day that it happened on July 18th? You know, I, I, was, I was not in Buenos Aires. I was in Salta, which is my hometown. I was 19 years old, but I remember it as a terrible day. Um, especially because we had the, the other bombing two years prior to that. So imagine for, for, Jewish, for Jews in Argentina, it was, we really felt we were not safe here. 
you know, that something very wrong was happening. Eduardo, talk about the impact throughout Latin America, because uh, as Adrián has just said, in Argentina, of course, uh, it, it uh, really hit right to the heart of the Jewish community. Uh, but uh, clearly, this uh, resonated uh, throughout uh, the entire uh, hemisphere. So tell us about that reaction. Well, uh, Latin America, and especially South America, did not understand what was uh, happening or didn't want to understand. In 1992, uh, the reaction of uh, Latin American uh, countries, Latin American governments, was to say, well, there, is a bomb, there, there has been a bombing in Buenos Aires against the Israeli embassy, but this is something like the import of the Middle East conflict, and this is something unacceptable for Latin America, and this is a Argentinian problem and a Menem's problem. But uh, it's interesting, because today in Uruguay, the president is by the name of Luis Lacalle Pou. At that time, the name of the president was Luis Alberto Lacalle Herrera, I mean the father of the current president of Uruguay. At that time, the relationship between Uruguay and Argentina was very close. The presidents were very close. And when the 1994 bombing took place, in Uruguay, July 18 is the national day. The president was in the official parade in the main square, etc., when the, the bombing took place. And look, what is the confusion? I am not blaming anyone. But the confusion was what the president of Uruguay and other presidents went very quickly to the Israeli embassy to give <clears throat> their sorrow and solidarity, etc. It was an attack on Argentina. It was an attack against the Jewish community. It was a clear anti-Semitic attack. At that moment, uh, the question of Iran was not so clear. The clear thing that the core, I mean the center of the heart of the Jewish community in Latin America, that is Argentina, was hurt and 85 people were killed. So the reaction of the countries and especially of the governments in Latin America was poor, were, was wrong, and they didn't realize that terrorism, like Hezbollah and other terrorism, was in Latin America some time ago. It showed in 1992, and it showed again in 1994. And worse and last, one day after the AMIA bombing, one day, only 24 hours after that bombing, the airplane Alas Chiricanas, a, a very small plane with 21 people in Panama, was blown down. 12 people were businessmen from the Jewish community. For 25 years, nobody took care about that. But two years ago, the Prime Minister of Israel said to the President of Panama that it was an Hezbollah crime. So at that time, in July, in 1818, there were two terrorist attacks in Latin America. One was huge, powerful, the, the AMIA bombing, and the governments didn't show any positive reaction. It's, it's, it's sad to say, but that was the question. And they were in solidarity with the government of Israel. And what about the Jewish community? Adriana, um, there was... Um a, a uh, demonstration, there was a march uh, in Buenos Aires. Um, I think it was, it was led by the president. I think the president of B'nai B'rith at that time actually went down to Buenos Aires uh, to join in this demonstration. Uh, but then it moved to the investigation phase. Um, why did it take so long to, to begin a trial? And how did that investigation and the trial end? You know, uh it's, it's really something uh, sad to remember, but the first years were really a disgrace. I don't have another word to define it. Um, uh, there was an investigation, some people were arrested, and then after about three years, everything needed to start all over again because the, the investigation was plagued with corruption. And, and, and irregularities. The judge was impeached for bribing a witness uh, in order to incriminate members of the federal police. All these policemen that had been arrested were released 
and the, everything was declared null and void and, it, and had to start it all over again. If you ask me what happened, it is still unclear. We know that the judge uh, bribed uh, the person that had sold the car and then was loaded with explosives. The reason is apparently because he wanted the, this person to incriminate uh, members of the federal police. Uh, the reason why he bribed this person and the, the, who gave the order is still unclear. The judge uh, was given six years in prison last year, uh, but nothing else happened. So everything is still, you know, uh, a big question mark. Um, after that, in 2005, uh, then President Nestor Kirchner uh, named Alberto, Alberto Nisman as the main prosecutor of the case. And a special investigative unit was created and he studied a very uh, serious, thorough investigation. He, in 2007, he was able to get Interpol red alerts for uh, very important members of the Iranian government. So let's yeah. let's uh, explain what the inter what a red alert means and 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 explain what Interpol means. Right, Interpol is the in international police agency, you know, and the alerts are arrest warrants. I mean, if 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 a person uh, who has a red alert travels to a country uh, that is member of Interpol, then that country has the obligation to arrest that person. And uh, in the case, may, some, some countries, you know, have extradition treaties. So if, it, if this is a country that has an extradition treaty with Argentina, that country is obliged to send that person to Argentina. So this is, this is very important. Um, the, he, he was able to secure red alerts against, I will read some of these names because uh, it's difficult to spell some of them, but uh, against very important people. Uh, one was intel uh, Iran's intelligence minister, Ali Falaya. Uh, the, the Mohsen Rezai, who was the commander in chief of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Ahmad Bahidi, who was at the time the commander of the Quds Force. You know, the Quds Force is a special unit within the uh, Guard Corps. This guy, Ahmad Bahidi, then became uh, Iran's uh, defense minister some years later. Uh, he also secured a red alert against the cultural attache at the embassy, at the Iranian embassy in Buenos Aires, Mohsen Rabani. And the third secretary of the Iranian embassy, Ahmad Reza Ashgari. And then he got a sixth um, red alert against a member, a very important member of Hezbollah. He was Hezbollah's number two at the time, ah, um, Imad Fayez Muniye. This person was killed uh, the following year in 2008 in Syria in a car, a car blast. Uh, now, Nisman also had requested red alerts again, the president of Iran at the time, Ali Rafsanjani, Hadi Soleimanpur, who was the ambassador in Buenos Aires, and then the foreign minister, Ali Akbar Velayari. But unfortunately, he didn't get those three. Um, and then in 2009, uh, he get a seventh red alert against a person known as Samuel Salman El Reda. He was a member of Hezbollah, but also had a Colombian passport, and he is believed to have coordinated the attack through the tri-border area, and he actually escaped Argentina one hour prior to the bombing. The evidence against these people is just overwhelming. I, I just want to stop there for a second and bring Eduardo in because while all of this was going on, let's go back to this, this trial, which went nowhere. This was a, a, a diversion, a distraction uh, to uh, the, the real facts and the evidence in the case. 
but Eduardo, we were, as B'nai B'rith, uh, we took a great interest in this case. And in fact, uh, we're represented, I think, every day during the course of that trial, which went on for a long time. Uh, Samuel Kaplan, Zichronul Ebracha, who was a president of B'nai B'rith Argentina, who was a vice president of B'nai B'rith Latin America, uh, decided to attend uh, every day, not only himself, but with other, with other uh, leaders of B'nai B'rith, but he was the leader. <clears throat> and it's strange because, of course, when you, when you start going to such a trial, uh, the first thing that you feel is hope, because there were 85 families of 85 people killed with a lot of hope that uh, justice could be served. And day by day, what Bernie Brit was discovering at the same time that the rest of the world was discovering is that something strange was going on in that trial, as Adriana said. And the fact that some years after, many years after, I, I can say, the, the only thing that justice was served was to put in prison Judge Galliano for six years because he made a mockery and he deceit as a judge and he's ashamed. For the, for the judiciary. But uh, at that time, there was hope. And the hope was based in three things. First of all, that the people in Argentina, the Jewish community in Argentina, and the neighbors in Argentina, they, they felt that the justice in Argentina was so uh, blowed by such a terrible attack that something would happen. And in some way, justice could be served at least some percent. The second thing, they trusted in the promises of the different governments, which was a mistake. But now we, uh, now we have the newspaper of Monday. I mean, we know the results. I mean, uh, at that time, they trusted. They trusted when the government went to the General Assembly in the United Nations and said that Iran must uh, do this and that, and Iran must recognize, and Iran must deliver after the red alerts the those accused, etc. And there was hope in what the governments were promising. And the third thing, that the society in Argentina, the civil society, not only the Jewish community, was moving all the time and moving hard. I mean, July 18 meant something, meant blocks and blocks and blocks full of people. This feeling in three, four, maybe five years were disappearing, unfortunately, and we know what happened. And the feeling, uh, of course, was uh, frustration. But Benibrit, what Benibrit did well is that after the trial started being a mockery and disappeared from, from, from the panorama, Benibrit never abandoned this, uh, this question. And you know that uh, even many times you and me were meeting uh, foreign ministers and we're meeting even the president of the country then, and etc. And always the first issue for B'nai B'rit was Amia. Even uh, any, anything were happening. But we, when we met somebody from the Argentinian government in OAS, in UN, in whatever, the first thing was Amia and saying there is a debt. And when Nisman, and last but not least, but when Nisman started being the uh, main prosecutor of, of, of this, B'nai B'rit did something more. I mean, I was with Nisman for at least two weeks in Central America in many countries because District 23, the District of Central America, Mexico, and North of South America, made a sort of tour to four or five countries. I mean, Panama, Guatemala, Costa Rica, etc. And Nisman delivered. And Nisman made a speech. And Nisman was very serious. And B'nai B'rit organized that. And I remember I had a lot of uh, conversations, we can talk it afterwards, a lot of conversations with Nisman. I saw a very firm person and a person that was absolutely sure of what he was doing, accusing and saying. So Benembrit was all the time along with this case and, it's, and still today we are. Adriana, so let's, uh, let's pick it up with the red alerts. Um, they're issued. Um, time passes, uh, nothing, nothing really happens. Um, and let's, let's fast forward to, to 2013. Um, 
Argentina and Iran signed a memorandum of understanding that uh, creates a commission uh, designed to, quote, reinvestigate the AMIA bombing. But ultimately, uh, the Argentine courts found the memorandum to be unconstitutional, and Iran never signed the deal anyway. So let's talk about that and talk about this long period of time uh, where, notwithstanding the fact that those red alerts were out there, nothing really moved. Yeah, well, um, as I said, Nisman achieved all this, and the evidence against these Iranians were just overwhelming. I mean, Interpol don't um, um, accept uh, to, to have these red alerts if the evidence is not really overwhelming. Um, the case could not advance further, not because uh, th there wasn't evidence, but because the Iranians never agreed to hand over the suspects to Argentina. That was the main reason. Uh, then in 2013, as you said, we were shocked by the news that the Argentinian government, uh, then headed by President Cristina Kirchner, had signed an agreement with the Iranians to jointly investigate the, 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 the case. Um, Alberto Nisman, who was a prosecutor, didn't know, was not informed of this agreement. The judge was not informed of this agreement. This agreement had been negotiated in secret for two years and was made public in 2013. What the government said was that uh, the case had been paralyzed, so they had to do something to advance the case. But to, you know, the Jewish community, most of people in the Jewish community, the opposition, uh, all the people that have been following the case, this sounded so absurd. Uh, I, you know, Argentina was uh, supposed to give confidential information to the people that were the main suspects in the worst terrorist attack ever suffered by, Argent by Argentina. Um, I always say that to me, it, it is like uh, negotiating with the Nazis to investigate the Holocaust, you know? Um, so right. uh, at the time, I think, because I didn't, I didn't have the opportunity to speak to him at the time, but I think that Nisman probably felt that his job, his work of so many years was at risk. And he started uh, to investigate what, what was behind that pact. Two years after, in 2015, he accused the president, her foreign minister, Hector Timmerman, and many people that had been, that had participated in that negotiation of having signed the pact in order to get impunity for the Iranians in exchange for certain trade and economic benefits. Now, he went public, he went on national TV and said this, and a few days after that, and the day before he was supposed to appear in Congress to expand on these allegations, he was found dead in his apartment, a bullet to the head. What the government, the first reaction of the government at, at the time was to say that it was a suicide, that he had committed suicide. This uh, could not be sustained for a long time. And so they started to, you know, people close to the government and some uh, journalists started to say that, you know, started to say things about him, trying to harm his reputation. And to this date, uh, we don't know what really happened to Nisman. Uh, we know he was murdered, but that's all we know. How did, how did this, this terrible development in this, in this case, uh, the, the murder of Nisman. Uh, how has it changed the trajectory and the focus of the investigation that uh, Nisman helped reopen? This is now five years ago. Uh, what, what has transpired? It seems that years and years, and we're talking now about 26 years, but there's a five-year period uh, between the time that Nisman was found dead and, and today. What's happened with this investigation? You know, the investigation is still on. Um, when, when uh, you know, Nisman was murdered in 2015, and that December, there was a new administration in Argentina, Mauricio Macri took office, and one of the first 
things that this government did is that they decided not to appeal a federal court decision that had declared the pact with Iran unconstitutional. By doing this, this pact was effectively killed, which was a good thing. Now, uh, the Iranians still try to get rid of the Interpol red alerts uh, because citing the pact that the government of Christina Kirchner had signed with them as evidence that Argentina had agreed to that. This, the red alerts are still on, fortunately, but they are still trying to get rid of them. You know, uh, they, they will never hand over the suspects to Argentina, but uh, they, they don't like the fact that they cannot travel freely. And so they want to get rid of these alerts. And that, that, as Nisman said, I believe that was the main reason why they signed that pact with Argentina. So the case is still on a limbo then. Um, but under the previous, under the previous government in Argentina, uh, there had been some talk uh, about a trial in absentia. Now, why, why didn't yes. that happen? Yes, you're right. The, there was a bill in Congress, and the government was uh, actually promoting it uh, to allow trials in absentia in Argentina. Uh, because right now uh, the laws here don't allow it. Um, but that went really nowhere. And now we have a new government in Argentina, as you know, Cristina Kirchner is our vice president and the political environment right now in Argentina is not conducive to that. I don't think it will happen anytime soon. Well, one of our obligations as a community together with the Argentine Jewish community, of course, uh, and Eduardo referenced our involvement, the involvement of other Jewish organizations as well, is to re really to keep this story, not just on the day of the anniversary, when we, we do it to commemorate, of course, uh, the dozens and dozens that were killed and injured, but uh, it should be every day uh, to, uh, to keep the pressure on uh, to bring this case uh, to a resolution and to bring those who did this to justice. Um, and it's something that, that we are obviously committed uh, to doing. Um, Eduardo, talking about um, Iran and Latin America, uh, in a recent interview, uh, the Organization of American States Secretary General Luis Almagro said that uh, Iran is operating inside Venezuela and uh, remains a, a real and uh, present danger uh, in the region. Um, yet, we don't seem to see too much reaction to that statement from other OAS member states or, or beyond, actually. Um, what can we and should we expect from OAS member states on this issue? Well, <clears throat> let's go uh, one step uh, backwards. Uh, when uh, we, as B'nai B'rith, uh, met the former president of Argentina, Mauricio Macri, and you remember because you were the, our leader in the delegation, uh, and you asked about the AMIA, the answer was not very hopeful when he's, not because of him, but when he said about the AMIA bombing is very difficult, but we want to clear up what happened with Alberto Nisman. And then I go what uh, Adriana said, unfortunately today, 2020, the, um, the trial, I mean, not the trial, but the process to know about Alberto Nisman is on, again, in this uh, administration, current administration, in darkness. So in this environment, the position and the statement of the Secretary General of OAS, I mean, Luis Almagro, saying that Iran is operating in, in, in Venezuela and it's a danger, it's very important. Uh, even though other countries are not reacting properly. Why? Because in the last uh, three or four weeks, I wouldn't say, I would say three weeks, for example, uh, Iran uh, has uh, showed up in uh, Caracas with uh, four, four big ships. And they say that they were carrying oil. Imagine, oil to Venezuela. I mean, this is the, the situation in Venezuela today. They have to be, the oil has to come from Venezuela. And uh, some, other, uh, some other things to, because of the humanitarian situation in Venezuela, which is the worst in Latin America. Last week, 
there was a question, uh, I mean, uh, an analysis made by the UN, and always the poorest country in Latin America was Haiti. No, today is Venezuela. This is not shameful, this is tragic. So Iran has brought uh, four ships in the last month. Who knows what is inside those huge, enormous ships? Oil, maybe. Uh, food, maybe. The rest, don't know. Second thing, there are Iranian people, uh, according to the Secretary General uh, position and uh, statement, uh, in Venezuela, inside Venezuela, uh, people of Hezbollah and people of uh, Iran. We know, we know, because it's an accusation made all, also by Secretary General and uh, all the staff, that in the triple border, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, I mean, where the, uh, the AMIA bombing started planning, uh, there are still people of Hezbollah because, as the Secretary General says, Isbala was in not only in Venezuela, but in Cuba, in Nicaragua, and in Bolivia. But now in Bolivia, probably they are not inside because the government has changed. So the, to make a, a, a short question and a long answer and make it a little shorter, the accusation of the Secretary General, it's uh, not shameful, but it's, it's very bad that countries like Brazil, Peru, Colombia, are not taken fully seriously because Colombia is in the border of Venezuela and they know what is the danger of having Hezbollah people and Iran there. And the second thing is that they are not, uh, what the Secretary General is not saying, well, we are going to have a terrorist attack in the, tomorrow or next week. But what he is saying, we have the main sponsor uh, state of uh, terrorism in the world here in the region, we have to be aware of that. And this is the failure that we see. I mean, the, the echo is too, too short, uh, too low, and uh, I think that the Secretary General is doing the best he can. And uh, the only result, just to end, the only result that we can see is that some countries have decided to, so, to declare properly, officially, that Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. Argentina, under Macri administration, did that last year. It was very important. And this administration didn't dare to change it. Tried, but didn't dare. Finally, they, they said that they were changing. They didn't. And there are other countries like Colombia, Honduras, and El Salvador. Brazil has promised, Uruguay has promised, but we don't, I mean, we don't like the promises, we like the facts. The question that these countries have realized that the question of terrorism is a danger and the Secretary General is right. Secretary General of OES, now that he was reelected, I am sure that he will insist that Isbala is declared a terrorist organization because he absolutely believes is a real danger for all the region, anytime, any moment. Well, we just have a little bit of time left. I want to go back to Adriana uh, for, for one question, then Eduardo to come back and wrap up. Um, Adriana, how will this um, terrorist attack be observed uh, in Argentina? And uh, is the public still aware of this? Uh, it, does the press cover this? Um, is the, the memory of, of this attack fading or not? You know, uh, the med there's always media, co extensive media coverage of this every year. People do remember it, uh, but so many years have passed, I think that people most people just don't have hope that justice will be served. Unfortunately, it's very sad, um, but I think that's the situation. Uh, this year, because of the pandemic, uh, we have uh, the main commemoration event will take place, uh, will be virtual. People will be able to follow it uh, through YouTube and I think Facebook. Uh, tomorrow, because the actual date is Saturday, but to avoid doing it on Shabbat, uh, it's going to take place tomorrow at 9.53 a.m., which is, was the exact time of the bombing. 
I know that the president of AMIA will speak and also relatives of the victims. And also as every year, you know, there are always artistic manifestations. So there are songs, videos, and works of art that have been prepared for this. There will be uh, works of art all over Buenos Aires, in the streets, uh, to make sure people don't forget this atrocity. Well, I have uh, visited the site a number of times, and uh, every time I, I see the uh, list of uh, the names of the victims, it's, it's uh, personalized in that way. Um, when you see the names of the victims, uh, and you're standing right there on the, on the site, um, it uh, really uh, causes one to think uh, about the perniciousness of terrorism, uh, the, the brutality of terrorism, and also to think about uh, justice unserved, as is the case in this particular uh, terrorist attack. Um, Eduardo, just to, to wrap up, uh, the state of anti-Semitism in, in Latin America, rather than go country by country, um, what would you say, where would you say we are today in terms of, of anti-Semitism uh, in the region. Uh, we've seen, of course, all over the world um, with the coronavirus. You know, it's like going back to the, to the plague back in the Middle Ages, uh, where Israel is blamed uh, for this, Jews are blamed for uh, the pandemic. Um, have you seen any, any particular spike uh, in Latin America on this issue or any issue um, relating to anti-Semitism? Yes, many. Unfortunately, many. Uh, with the excuse of the pandemic and without the excuse of the pandemic. But uh, of course, Chile, unfortunately, is at the head of that. The Palestinian community in Chile, which is the largest in the world, has moved very, very hardly. I mean, in, uh, in Congress, in the media, and uh, in other public offices. The, of all, uh, always the tactic or the system of the Palestinian community in Chile is to demonize Israel, but uh, they know that with demonizing Israel and blaming Israel for all the evils of Middle East and the world, what they are getting is in, inciting, inciting anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism in Chile has increased in, in, uh, in social media brutally, brutally in the last uh, month and a half or two months. And if there is no violence still, I mean violence in the streets against uh, Jewish people, uh, it's because of the pandemic. I mean, because that Santiago, which is the capital city of uh, Chile, is in, uh, in forced quarantine because the situation is very serious with the pandemic. But we have also seen the question of uh, anti-Semitism in social media in other countries. In my country, in my country, in uh, Uruguay, again, again, we have seen uh, uh, movements in the social media. And why? Because there is, uh, and I end with this, there is a group called the Group of Puebla. Puebla is a city in Mexico. And some time ago, a year and a half or two years ago, when still there were populist governments ruling in Latin America, in Brazil, uh, uh, in, uh, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, of course, Cuba, etc., they formed the Group of Puebla. What is the Group of Puebla? Well, it's uh, a group that is against the United States, as you can imagine. And today they are not ruling the countries because the Group of Puebla is formed by Lula, former president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, former president of Brazil, Jose Mujica, former president of Uruguay, uh, Rafael Correa, former president of Ecuador, Evo Morales, former president of Bolivia. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the president of Argentina has joined all the meetings of the Group of Puebla in the last two months. And 10 or 15 days ago, there was a group of 200 people that made a statement uh, on the, on the context of a supposed and alleged annexation in Israel, but what they said, what they said, that Israel is uh, perpetrating apartheid and Israel is guilty for uh, war crimes and crimes of uh, humanity. And who signed those, uh, uh, this uh, document? 
those former presidents. So as uh, Mujica signed for Uruguay or Lula for Brazil uh, or uh, Evo Morales for Bolivia, the incitement made again anti-Semitism in the media and some politicians, of course. These kind of documents that are showing up these days and they are moving very fast in Chile are making anti-Semitism on the rise. Uh, and uh, of course, we know about violence and anti-Semitism. We are talking about uh, two terrorist attacks, so we know about violence. So we have to be very careful when the leaders of countries, I mean, former presidents, are demonizing Israel, we can expect bad moments. So we, as Jewish community and as B'nai B'rit, we are on alert. Well, Adriana, uh, Eduardo, we're at the end of our time. Thank you both for joining us today for this conversation. We'll, of course, have you back uh, to discuss uh, some of the other issues uh, that Eduardo has raised and also uh, to uh, continue uh, to follow closely uh, the AMIA case uh, in Argentina. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank have you. Have a nice weekend. My pleasure. Well, thank, thank you to my colleagues, Adriana Commissar and Eduardo Cohn, for joining me today. And thank you for tuning in to this edition of Conversations with B'nai B'rith. If you found this conversation to be of interest, make sure you never miss a show by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel. And be sure to visit our website, b'nai to learn about our work, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. For my guests, Adriana Commissar and Eduardo Cohn, I'm Dan Mary Ashen. We'll see you next time on Conversations with B'nai B'rith International.